And uh, finally, I've got uh, obviously Linda Oakley, who's the introduction, talking about citizens' dividends. The problem when people say that is that no one ever introduces me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, in the company of such great people, I'm thinking to myself, I'm just a guy who's been dragged along into the world of politics. Having thought I'd almost escaped it, I realised that politics is less like a profession, more like malaria, because it flares up about every four years. Um, I'm having one of those episodes at the moment. Uh, I'm here because myself and uh, Ed Joyce wrote a book called The Alternative View, and in it we try to take a look at a very simple question, what is it that the Liberal Democrats can do to really provide a distinctive agenda which is liberal and is democratic? And we've been back to 1844 already, I'm going to fast forward right into the future up to 1879, uh, where the journey that I'm taking you through briefly begins. Uh, I'm very persuaded by what well, I've already heard, and appalled, frankly, to realize that 97% of the money in the country isn't real. Um, I'm thinking of starting a bank on that basis before you succeed in preventing me from printing my own money for myself. Uh, this could, could be a solution for, for some of my own problems. Um, but uh, perhaps before I do that, uh, I might seek to make a contribution in the policy context towards the citizens' dividend, and that's what I'll restrict my comment to this evening. In 1879, uh, a chap called George, nothing to do with Lloyd George, a chap called George uh, actually wrote a book called, let me find it, do you remember what it was called? Progress, yeah. Progress, yeah. Progress, yeah. Progress, yeah. Um, and just, uh, Progress and Poverty. Progress and Poverty, yeah, Henry George. And as you know, his concept is completely consistent with what we've had already. The mood music's the same up here. And he said, as we know from the Liberal Democrat anthem, that the land belongs to the people. Uh, that anthem, of course, has very telling words uh, in it. Uh, the third, sorry, the, uh, the penultimate uh, verse says, Clear the way for liberty, the land must all be free. Liberals will not falter from the fight, the stern it be. Uh, I do have a concern that we have moved away from that fight, and I'll make some suggestions on how we get back to it. Um, in essence, the concept of a citizen's dividend is completely consistent with what you want to do to create real money and over time hopefully uh, get us away from the artificial world that we've created. And what Ultra wants to do, which is create a fairer form of uh, redistribution of wealth. My judgment is that if we are true to the core um, ethos of this party, we haven't got any alternative except to stand up against um, the conservative ethos, which quite clearly is different, doesn't make it wrong, I just don't happen to agree with it. Now let me be specific about two things. First of all, what a citizen's dividend is supposed to do, and then secondly, how we might introduce it. Uh, a citizen's dividend, as I'm sure you pretty much all know, uh, is the idea of giving direct access, just in the same way that Alter wants to do with, uh, with land, direct access to the wealth which isn't, should not be owned and should not be possessed by a very small proportion of the population and sharing with the entire population. Uh, the rationale for that is both moral and psychological. Morally, because it's right, we can either agree with that or disagree with that. To both positions are legitimate, my position is obvious. And psychologically, because it does seem that in the example which I'm about to share with you of a citizen's dividend in action, there was a positive good in the society in which it occurred. Uh, once again, uh, I don't want to uh, make any assumptions about how many of you are aware of this, but let me share with you the example from Alaska. In Alaska, the government decided that they had to do something to redistribute wealth. Uh, the statistics were quite stark. In 1960, uh, in terms of crime, there were roughly 1,500 offences per 100,000 citizens. These are approximate figures. By 1981, there were almost 6,000 offences, law-breaking offences, in terms of convictions per 100,000 citizens. So they call that by a factor of from 1,500 to, to 6,000, four times more. At that point, they introduced a citizen's <coughs> dividend with regard to oil revenues in the country. By 2009, the number of offences had halved to below 3,000 offences per 100,000 um, uh, population. I put it to you, and if you look at the, the actual circumstances of Alaska, I think this is completely 
defensible as a claim. I put it to you, it is for the very simple reason that the citizen's division was attached to a condition. If you were found guilty of offence, you lost your dividend. So there was a tremendous incentive for people to not uh, offend and therefore lose that incentive. The other thing about it, of course, is that just as you've heard, uh, particularly in terms of land tax reform, it's fair because it directly shares the value of land which wasn't created by us and the value of minerals in the example I've just given you, oil, uh, with a population who just happens to be there. And it makes it impossible for a very small number of people to own the lion's share of that reward. Obviously, people can still make money out of the oil industry and so forth, but in principle, it prevents people from being able to hoard that wealth. Now, I would suggest in the research, we researched this in great detail, and credit to Ed Joyce as well, who did a huge amount of work in looking at this to make sure we got our facts right. Uh, it also seems that it creates a certain cohesion amongst the public who resist very strongly any effort to have this uh, incentive removed. And there was talk by the government in, uh, in, in that region of, of, of removing or curtailing the citizens' dividend, and it became politically impossible for, not, for them not to do it. Therefore, there's a, a spin-off benefit because it empowers the population uh, to uh, defend that right and to actually uh, th effectively threaten uh, politicians who want to take that right away for whatever good intended, well-intended reasons. Uh, that prevents them from, from taking the clock back to where we were before. Uh, two other thoughts about this. One is that uh, there is a great deal of um, evidence to suggest that once a thing like this is in place, not only it is it self-sustaining, but it changes people's attitudes as well. Now, uh, it, it looks to me like uh, what happened with the citizens' dividend caused uh, the, the people of Alaska to feel part of a unit. Now, that's harder to quantify, but there could be some social benefits in doing that. The second one is, there is no practical or moral reason on earth why we couldn't do it in the United Kingdom. So this leads me to my last question. What's stopping us from doing it? You've kind of already heard. It's vested interest. There are lots of people who absolutely don't want to do this because they're going to lose out. I think that's a discussion that we can have as a group in a short while. But there isn't really any other reason to stop this kind of a change. Nor is there any reason why the Liberal Democrats, even while being in coalition with a government, with a party which quite clearly it, it supports the interests of, of people who have got plenty of land, there is no reason on earth why we shouldn't be actively promoting this. There's a political benefit because it's fair. And even more importantly, there's a practical benefit if we can replicate some of the things that we've seen in the Alaskan model. What should happen next then? My personal view is that rather than just talking about these kinds of things, we should be actively promoting them, even if that raises the heckles of our coalition partners. Funnily enough, that doesn't really upset me too all that very much. Uh, I think once in a while they've been a little bit opportunistic at our expense in the past. And it also means we've got a real story to tell the British people that we're actually going to give a citizen's dividend of the, the accidental wealth of the nation back to the people, rather than back to the rich people in the country. You probably know this already, but uh, uh, I think it's, it's very telling uh, that uh, Nick Clegg, Chris Hewn and Vince Cable were all members of Alter. I'm not sure if they've renewed recently. They but don't have to pay, by the way. We, we just allow, they just allow us to use their names. <laughs> Do they still allow that? Apparently. Oh, that's okay, that's fine. That's great. Well, let's not, let's not remind them of that. That's okay. um, that's, in that case, I have to assume that they're still members of Alter. So, actually, three of the most important people, uh, all having served as cabinet ministers, still support the rationale. So, my request for them is, could you either explain what's detaining you from taking a distinctive alternative view, or do it? I don't think we should be in a situation where the argument is clear-cut and completely obvious to anybody who knows the history of the liberal movement, but at a time when we could make some pretty big noise about this, by being in government, uh, we resist doing so. What could be the consequences? A strain in the coalition. Well, ideologies sometimes create fiction. Other problems could be the prospects of success. Well. 
frankly, anybody who joined the Liberal Democrats in 1990 knows that it wasn't a time when you were joining the Lib Dems because it was the Manchester United of politics. I joined it when I was at 3% of the opinion polls with a statistical variation of plus or minus 4%. I joined it because I believed in this crazy idea that having an underlying moral fabric to what you're doing is more important than making it easy to get elected. And lo and behold, somehow we managed to do both. So my request to the party, and hopefully to yourselves, is that we begin to put pressure on the decision makers in the leadership at the moment, not to change policy, but just to apply it. Is that too much to ask? Mm. Okay, we've got around half an hour for questions. Um, and I'm going to start...